Uh, hi, I'm uh, Dr. Steve Kleinschmidt. I am the director of the Master of Science in Civic Analytics program. Uh, and as Derek mentioned, this is my third time presenting here at Chi Hack Night. Um, each time, at least the first two times, have been kind of a, well, I think the first one was on the development of the program, the, the Civic Analytics program, before, a year before it even started. Uh, and then the second one was essentially uh, looking at a kind of an after action review after our first group of uh, students had come through, what are the things that we've learned. Uh, this presentation is taking sort of a bit of a different tack, um, if you will. Um, I'm going to be covering, uh, I will again uh, bring up some of, the issue, some of the things about our program design, but primarily as a way to sort of explain the kind of context in which I'm, I'm uh, uh, presenting the rest of this framework, which is somewhat research oriented, but I wanted to make sure that it was very applicable to uh, this audience. Um, I'll say that I'm gonna preface this with uh, the idea behind this presentation is to understand what is the domain knowledge that we need to essentially make government operations run well. Uh, a form of public sector data science. Um, I've seen it before all over the place. People talk, you talk about you need domain knowledge. Uh, you'll see it on Reddit forums, you'll see it on LinkedIn, you'll see in, in social media people say, oh, I went to, uh, you know, I, I, I studied data science and I know computation and statistics, but I need to have domain knowledge. So that's basically what this is, is essentially creating a field that we, uh, uh, some researchers myself have created called administrative informatics that focuses very heavily on the needs of state, local, and regional government, uh, and also in, into federal government. But I'll tell you why, essentially we, we're taking a different tack. What are the, the sort of skills that you need and how that differs from currently uh, the type of, uh, what would exist in the public data science movement. So what is, uh, you know, we're not only talking about education program development, we're talking about uh, you know, what things are needed in practice and what sort of research do people like me need to do to ensure that people who are coming through who are going to be public data practitioners are actually trained in the things that uh, government agencies need. Uh, again, mentioned this is my third presentation. I've already gave that preface. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the structure here, um, I'll, I'll allude to the MSCA program design, how it was different. Um, what the, the, the current gaps in public data research and practice are, uh, and then explain the need for a, a new lens by which we should um, explain these uh, things. Uh, so first, public sector data science, you know, certainly not the first technical movement that has come through, you know, things like open data and e-government and, and other uh, mobile government applications uh, preceded it, but the rise of public sector data science began in earnest in the early uh, 2010s. You know, there's some early movement into, you know, just a little bit earlier than that, but uh, you start to see the rise of institutional structures that uh, city information officers, data teams, degrees are being formed that uh, specifically allow people to study things like public policy and, and data. So um, as a field, public sector data science is pretty young. Um, almost all the research that was dedicated it, to it in, in the last, uh, uh, the early part of the, the, the last decade and into now have been dedicated primarily to what we call smart cities and to policy analytics. Uh, so smart cities, uh, you know, this, this kind of integration of economic systems, technical systems, data, um, uh, 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 all sorts of things like that. Um, but a lot of it's focused in sort of applications. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'll, I'll pull it back a second. A uh, second part is policy analytics, the development of, uh, of, uh, of methods and technologies that can take advantage of the capacities for computer science and uh, statistics to create new forms of data analysis that at scales that we haven't been able to see before. Um, but the problem that I've kind of identified through this and my researchers have identified is that um, it's not relevant to a lot of areas of practice because of the scale and the complexity involved uh, that, um, uh, yeah, things like um, federal agencies have very specific data needs, uh, private sector services consulting, major metropolitan areas. A, a city like Chicago essentially acts more like a, it, it acts more like a nation than it does a city in the traditional sense. So a city that might have 150, 200, 200, 300,000 people aren't going to be able to produce the type of capacity or have the type of resources to implement very, uh, 
uh, advanced type of technology, and they may not, not have the need to do so. So administrative informatics is around this idea of creating a form of public sector data science that is implementable in line agencies, in state, regional, local, and, and some federal agencies. So essentially, what is the domain knowledge that is needed? And I appreciate you. <laughs> this is going to be a bit of a, of, of a journey, but uh, I, I, it'll, it'll all make sense, I, I promise you. Uh, so, so yeah, um, then there's a need for digital transformation. Government agencies, you know, in the aggregate sense, are behind the times as it comes to the degree of technical uh, knowledge and skills and the employment of digital resources, particularly when compared to the, the, the private sector. And when the private sector is advancing much faster than government's ability to uh, 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 incorporate some of the same technologies and understand the regulatory issues around it. Um, we need to have a, a different model that can help facilitate a faster evolution. And that's um, mostly what I'm looking for. So, so this is a roadmap that I'll go over. But um, so one of the things I start off, and I, I have about two or three slides that talk about the civic analytics program. But I use it as a illustrative mechanism to sort of discuss sort of the differences between things like uh, policy analytics and administrative informatics. So I, I think it's just a little bit of a background. Uh, so I usually show this, you know, even part of like recruiting displays, I've showed it at conferences, but it explains kind of some of the substantive area differences in our degree programs at UIC, uh, our Master of Public Administration, uh, Master of Public Policy, and, and the Civic Analytics program. Uh, the Master of Public Administration, Public administration itself is the running of the business of government. Um, governments need to have strategic plans. They need to deliver services. They, they need to develop budgets. They've got to manage people. Uh, think of them as basically the MBAs of the, the public sector. So the orientation of, uh, of public administration is to make government run well um, and to make uh, uh, service delivery effective and efficient. Uh, contrast that, uh, public policy is a bit more specialized. Public policy is about creating uh, rules and policies and uh, uh, institutions and essentially they're solutions people. Uh, so uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, what were some of the solutions that were offered by the public policy realm? Uh, mask mandates, uh, 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 restaurant closures, uh, uh, vaccine uh, type things like that. Uh, but, but also stuff like, you know, how do we construct effective, affordable housing programs? How do we make transit uh, systems uh, uh, more equitable? Uh, what are the policy solutions? Uh, government rules, regulations, uh, sometimes uh, voluntary appeals, tax incentives. These are all types of policy tools that we teach in public policy. So you can see it's a bit different from public administration. Uh, then with civic analytics, very specialized, uh, or a bit more specialized, that we, we focus on things, you know, the more technical hard skills, data visualization, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, civic technology, geospatial methods, things like that. So a bit more orientation to hard skills. Where we differ in civic analytics, and this in part becomes the basis for administrative informatics, is that um, what's pretty much unique about our civic analytics program is that we cross over these domains very well, that we give people sort of the, the training, not only, not only in the traditional policy analysis, uh, policy analysis, policy process, some of those things that you would expect from an MPP, but we'd also uh, give you introduction to government operations, program evaluation, administrative uh, uh, aspects of, of, of administrative tasks. So, uh, so being able to understand not only public policy, but the implementation side, how government is run, how it's evaluated, how uh, uh, organizational change happens, all those things like that. So we, we've created this interdisciplinary concentration that, that, that uh, combines the hard skills and the soft skills of, uh, of, of computational science and statistics with uh, training in public management and in public policy. So we want to give you a bit of exposure to the type of needs that are, are, are needed in public uh, policy. And I'll even just, uh, this kind of last aspect before I go straight into administrative informatics, but when you look at our program, you should be, you should see not only what we, uh, what courses we offer that are the same as uh, maybe other sort of uh, uh, manifestations of public data science, but what's different? What, what's 
part of our curriculum is manifestly different than anywhere else you see um, and provides uh, types of ca capabilities and capacities that aren't typically seen in a public sector data science program. So we have hard skills and soft skills, and I've highlighted, with the exception, exception of the GIS uh, in section B, you know, uh, also I want to preface, uh, I know it has credit hours, we, we have four credit hour classes, so when people look at it and like, oh, that looks like a lot of hours, it's actually less. Um, it's the same amount of classes that you would take, but anyway, I'm getting, getting off track here. Um, but um, with the exception of GIS, a lot of these courses, uh, project management, uh, economics, uh, program evaluation, uh, all these, these uh, the soft skills, particularly in the public service foundations, uh, data ethics and information security, public policy development and process, these are some of the things that really constitute this program domain knowledge that becomes the basis for administrative informatics. So when people talk, what are the things I need to know? You know, not only can I get hired uh, at, at an analyst level, but once you start moving up the chain and you're thinking about your career progression, you're going to want to move up to a director position, uh, a, a section chief, or uh, uh, perhaps be a chief information officer or chief data officer. Uh, what are the type of, the, the type of skills you need are going to change as you move up there, and uh, also just the value you can provide because you understand public problems, you understand the processes, the common tasks that, 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 that happen in the local state and uh, regional government. Uh, so yeah, th this is one thing that we take a quite a different tack from others on, and this is part of what becomes the basis for administrative informatics is, is understanding essentially how you fit in to a larger, you know, even like classes like PA 431, civic technology. How you fit into the civic technology ecosystem. Organizations like Shy Hack Night that, that rely on civic innovation. And the traditional government technology and GovTech uh, markets. Database journalism, digital activism, all these type of realms that you wouldn't be exposed to in, in other types of degree programs. Uh, strategic versus operational data. Um, a lot of policy level operations in government are in things like mayor's offices, they're in uh, high-level policy research outfits, they're very specialized. Um, a lot of them work towards primarily to do high-level research that provides recommendations for policy uh, and, and uh, strategic level reports that you know, uh, uh, help inform mayors and governors and things like that. And that's something that we teach. We, we teach policy analysis, we teach program evaluation. Uh, and, and policy process, uh, but we also have a very strong orientation towards the operational side. So when you have uh, data uh, across the organization, when you have datafication in smaller context within agencies, uh, being able to understand all the different aspects of a government agency, all the different types of data they collect, uh, all the different institutional silos that are created, essentially, uh, how do we, we train people who are very much anchored in understanding, I want to know how to make government run better, make it more efficient, more accountable, uh, more democratic, uh, in, in line with our public values. Uh, but yeah, our orientation is less oriented towards high level strategic policy analysis, you know, although we have people and graduates who serve in strategic level organizations, but, but people who understand the nuance of the data ecosystem in, in government and public organizations. They've been broadly cross-trained. Uh, they get specific training in a lot of very essential skills, but they're introduced to a lot of different data formats, structures, applications, processes that make them immensely valuable in ways that we just really haven't seen before. Uh, also push that um, we need people who, um, th the civic, data uh, and, and government technology kind of industries are very big and uh, there's been a move, you know, there's heavy pressure to vendorize a lot of government operations rather than try to develop these things in-house. Um, and we do need people who have the capacity and leadership to be able to um, try to, you know, try to implement some of the things in-house but also can be able to discern when it's appropriate to contract or subcontract. Uh, they recognize the ethical and other dilemmas of trying to sometimes impose technologies onto a public problem that aren't necessarily designed to, to solve those problems. And um, that's a, a lot of what we do, is just try to understand this, that we're, we're still kind of, we're moving out of the, 
I don't think we're, we're, we're in sort of the America Online kind of CompuServe age, but we're probably around Yahoo or the establishment of Google, you know, when it comes to the public data, sec uh, uh, public data science and uh, data sector movement in terms of its research and prescriptive guidance and, and all these things like that. So we're, it's very early. Uh, so what are some of the gaps that we've identified that administrative informatics uh, will serve? Uh, so first, I'd say uh, less, em less emphasis on policy analysis and, and analytics and more on uh, the operational data needs of public agencies. So, um, so what are the, the, essentially, what are the, the day in, day out needs of government uh, that, that make, make it run and, and uh, essentially keep it accountable? Uh, another one, um, and this is one thing that I really see throughout Chi Hack Night and the, the, uh, the projects that have come out of this, is that you need an understanding of administrative burdens and processes. Um, a number of the projects, um, I remember when Expunge.io was, was around, um, uh, the name of the the um, the project to to sign up for SNAP benefits. Oh, M relief. Uh, what's it? M relief. Uh, oh yeah, M relief. Yeah, so M relief. Even um, so, like M relief being able uh, uh, phone based application, text based application that helps people uh, uh, apply for SNAP benefits. Uh, Expunge.io. How to take a complex process to. Uh, expunge a juvenile c conviction for, uh, uh, get it off your record so it'll, it'll help you move on with your life. Uh, um, you're, it's, it's legal to do and you don't need a lawyer to do it, but it's very complex and there's a lot of steps. Uh, even applying for the student loan relief, if you remember the Joe Biden's, uh, the Biden administration's student loan relief program, uh, their process was like a one page form or online form that uh, took less than five minutes to complete. Um, that's unheard of and unprecedented in just about any sort of uh, 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 circles when you look at administrative burdens. Uh, and a you know, shout out to Don Moynihan at Georgetown, uh, wrote a great book on administrative burdens, but we need people to some, who, technologists who understand that not everything you need to do to improve people's lives has to be based in code and advanced, uh, uh, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and all these kind of bespoke technical applications. A lot of it is just understanding how to use technology to optimize the processes that we already go through and to make them better and to, and to make uh, the public interfacing, you know, when they need to pay their, their property taxes, when they need to file a permit, when they need to request a Freedom Information Act request, uh, that these are easy to do, they are quick, they're reliable and uh, and um, and uh, yeah, these things don't always involve exquisite types of of, of coding and, and data science. Often, these are going to be low code or no code solutions uh, that are just going to be people who are using technology to to make uh, processes run better. Um, understanding the common tasks for state and local government, uh, I'll go a little bit of that when I go into the framework. Um, I still got. Plenty of time, so I'm uh, be able to put a little uh, uh, emphasis on that. Uh, but knowledge of public problems and social research methodologies. Uh, one of the main feedback items I get for when I engage stakeholders across Chicago is that they say, I've tried to hire somebody, you know, they have a master in data analytics or they have an undergraduate degree in computer science, and they come in not knowing anything about government. They don't know about the data. They don't know about the problems. They don't know the prevailing methodologies, the, 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 the public institutions, uh, the legal infrastructure that, that surrounds these things. So there's a lot of domain knowledge that you really need to be in the public sector. And um, that's part of what we provide and that's a lot what administrative informatics provides. It's like just understanding the business of government, um, particularly in local government, there's, just, there's a lot of reoccurring, very similar processes, you know, preparing annual budgets, program evaluations, uh, uh, even, you know, traditional stuff. And I've, I've, got, I've got a student from my program looking and it's just like, yeah, program evaluation. Nobody would thought about putting that into a data science program, but when you create a dashboard, do you even understand how to set it up systematically? Do you know, could you be, be able to spot problems with data and, and how it's collected and um, uh, the assumptions that are underlying that the system you create? So it's, it's more about understanding the nuance that, that, that comes behind serving in the public sector rather than just uh, trying to impose a particular technical rational viewpoint on top of it. It's, it's very much uh, a confluence of technical skills, computational, you know, statistics, computation, and that domain knowledge. 
Uh, digital transformation, uh, again, government's real far behind in being able to see, uh, uh, to, to, to catch up to the private sector. Um, and you need buy-in, you know, organizations change as they become more datafied, as they become more technical. Uh, it, it changes the dynamics underlying uh, 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 human resources and who you hire and, and uh, that there, there's sometimes there's resistance to organizational change and uh, people don't want to learn this or uh, there's politics that some people are expert at something and then now they've got to learn a new skill set. So learning how to engage in digital transformation and, and technology-induced organizational change is, is a great skill that, that, that's needed. Um, and, and that goes hand in hand, improving digital literacy across the organization. We don't want just quants at the top, we want them in the middle and we want them what we call kind of the street level bureaucrats, or as I call them, uh, or I've heard referred to as keyboard level bureaucrats. As we have more and more people using big data in small context, the, 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 we need more people who are capable and literate in how to use data and be able to analyze it because they're, a lot of them are going to be data originators. Uh, if they're out there doing field research or surveys or they're, they're the ones creating data, um, I, I've seen the, uh, uh, you know, like you think about, uh, was a presentation on the Chicago gang data, database that people had done in the past. Uh, it was a long time ago. I've seen it before, but yeah, yeah. It's like so. Would uh, you know that if if some if such a database was going to exist, but it's riddled with inaccuracies, uh, problems with iterator reliability. Everybody's entering data in a different way. They're coding things different. Is it even meaningful when it gets sent up the chain to organizations that are supposed to be using it for strategic decision making? So improving literacy across the organization is something that's going to be uh, very important uh, as, as government agencies work towards digital transfer, uh, transformation. Contracting, vendor management. Um, <laughs> I was fortunate to have one of my students for a independent study class that really made me dig into this area and I, I noticed there was a gap that uh, it doesn't matter if it's Chicago or New York or if it's the state of Montana, uh, there's a need for e-government and e-delivery uh, of, of government services. So uh, what things do we try to do in-house? When do we contract? How do we, we deal with manage, uh, uh, vendors and, and, uh, and manage those things? And even the fundamentals of project management, that the more and more your agency starts to work like a tech or you know a, a tech startup or a software company. It needs to change its orientation and processes to make it adaptable um, and and to make it more agile, uh, agile management things like that. Of course, data ethics. When is the use of a technological solution actually harmful to the population? Uh, we've we've definitely seen examples. Uh, of pushback uh, here in Chicago, things like the whole Clear, Clearview AI thing about using facial recognition technology, uh, law enforcement applications and things like that. We need people who understand that technology can systematically exclude, it can harm, it can, uh, uh, it can discriminate, it, uh, uh, digital redlining in the private sector and, and even some public sector applications where uh, we end up creating new inequities where things didn't exist because of the, the technologies and the data structures that we've adopted. So administrative informatics, this is the framework that I, I would do it and it's, you know, it's still kind of, it's in development, but I'd say a lot of the things are, are settled. But as, a, as I mentioned, so domain knowledge, not only just for degree programs, but in terms of building a, a, a framework that can help guide the development of professional development programs, technical training programs, uh, 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 new educational programs, uh, and, and also sort of reveal what are the, the, the common tasks that are really need, needed in the local, state, regional, uh, and even federal domains. Uh, what are the domain knowledges that we've identified that are consistent and used in government but are not showing up in, in existing literature and educational uh, programs? So, um, so we'll get into it. So I mentioned before, if you're gonna, f if you're gonna design a subfield, Essentially, the, uh, the way that it's been traditionally done and, and sort of the common thing is that, uh, you know, data science was a com combination of computer science and statistics, uh, but as new subfields form, we, we see the rise of new subfields, not only just in the public sector, but, you know, of course, business analytics, public health informatics, uh, a whole rash of new uh, institutions and career groups and even academic programs that are specialized around this idea that we need to combine 
computational knowledge and the capacity of, of, of computations, uh, we need to combine that with the stati statistical and research methods, but we need to craft a, uh, an understanding of, of the field and the field's need through domain knowledge. So th this is kind of uh, essentially th the common thing, but in the middle is what I call ASIC or, or application and system integration knowledge. And that's, uh, that's what I'll get, in, uh, get into now. ASIC is essentially the combination of hard skills and soft skills that we often see used in state, local, regional government uh, and, and, and federal agencies. So applications, the hard skills, uh, we teach you R in our civic analytics program that there are some more, there are some, some schools and some applications that teach, uh, or programs that teach Python. We, we uh, have done primarily R because that's what's been, uh, been used, but, uh, but learning about these things, you know, Tidyverse and, and Shiny and, and a lot of these R-based applications uh, in the analytics space, uh, public data formats. So, program evaluation data, administrative data, census data, geospatial data, things like shapefiles and geodatabases. Uh, all these things are used every single day in almost all, all these agencies, and I'm surprised at the number of people who often don't get exposed to any of those as part of their program. So that's, that's part of something that has been integrated across our curriculum is to cross-train you in all the different sources of data, uh, that this data hierarchy that exists uh, is very uh, useful. Um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, neural networks, uh, random forest models. Uh, there's some great applications here around the city of Chicago and throughout Illinois for property tax assessment and, and uh, 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 food inspection. I remember seeing Tom Schenk come here and talk about uh, the food inspection model that they, they had created. So, um, and being able to reduce foodborne illness in the city of Chicago, I think it was like 30% in just a couple years by using that algorithm to redispatch inspectors uh, because the, uh, the uh, machine learning model actually found the things that cause food board illness. And instead of relying, if I uh, uh, remember, instead of relying on the letter grades A, B, C, or D, it was the type of violation that was more important than the actual letter grade that the, the restaurant got. And that cr proved to be much more predictive of the types of places where people would have food board illness. Um, I hope Tom's watching if I get any of that wrong, but uh, that's my recollection of all that. Um, actually, I, I, I hope he is watching so he can correct me on Twitter. <laughs> um, geospatial analysis, uh, GIS. I think this is one of the, gr the biggest things that are missing in educational training programs and practice. Everything exists in the physical world. Uh, there's something called Tobler's Law that uh, you know, everything's related to everything, but some things are closer than others. Uh, that we understand that our, our public problems are in part rooted in the physical realities that we deal with. Um, there's a reason why if there's a coffee shop down the street and then there's one eight blocks away, you go to the one down the street because it's proximity, it's proximity measures. So if we want to understand human behavior, we have to understand the spatial relationships that underlie human behavior. Uh, so I take a real heavy tack on this, uh, but also for visualizations, how you, you know, the right color choice, uh, the right statistical tool, um, even spatially constructed problems like, uh, like, like food deserts. How do you even know you have a food desert unless you are able to map and construct a, a, pr a problem or construct around a spatial relationship? Uh, data storage and management. Um, I'm getting, in, getting close to time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit of this. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we, we cover e-government, mobile platforms, network analysis, UI, UX, um, you know, making sure that government e delivery of e-government services is, is equitable, it's uh, that uh, 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 accessible, that we understand uh, how to create good design that's, uh, uh, that, that's useful, but we combine these hard skills and applications with system integ integration knowledge. So uh, if you're going to be working in budget analytics, you have to understand budgeting and economic forecasting. Um, that if you're going to set up dashboards and collect data, you should have a, b a background in program evaluation and, and performance uh, measurement. Uh, policy analysis, you know, I've already kind of mentioned thing on policy analysis, but yeah, that do the tools that we have constructed to do the business of government actually work? Can they be improved? Uh, because there's not a, a traditional price mechanism, can it, uh, can we actually discern whether or not our, our policies, programs are working? And if not, uh, can, we, can we put in things to change? Project management, government ethics, 
uh, privacy, information security, uh, organizational innovation, and even data storytelling, kind of complement to data visualization. So how do you, once all the analysis is done and you've created the beautiful visualizations, how do you construct a story that is compelling, that will get people to change their behavior, that will convince legislatures that bills need to be t uh, passed, uh, that essentially makes uh, all this jungle jumbled kind of gar uh, you know, garbled technicalese be something that the average person can understand. Uh, so with, uh, just finish up uh, about 30 seconds. So next steps, um, I give a shout out to my co-author, Michael Overton at the University of Idaho. He's the one who's been helping me on a lot of this. But we're working to further delineate this um, applications and system integration framework. We want to use it to help develop better uh, professional development training programs. We want to provide guidance to other academic programs uh, that may not be able to create a custom degree like we've done, but may be able to offer some courses that will help uh, train future public servants, increase digital li uh, literacy, but also we want to continue to help inform people like you who are in the civic innovation space and, and engage you and uh, know how we can help uh, create a better public service and, and uh, better public interest technology through engaging the civic, and, uh, civic innovation uh, community. So with that, uh, thank you very much. That's the end of my presentation. So I, I believe it goes to question and answer. Thank you, Steve. How did you get into this work? Um, I guess I've got kind of an interesting background. Um, you know, my PhD is in public policy, but I started college, I was a computer science major, and uh, I ended up with a degree in geography and urban and regional planning, and then a master's in technology systems. So I've, I've always had an interest in tech. I'd say it's kind of emblematic of a lot of people in the public technology space is that I wasn't initially oriented towards doing things in the public sector. Um, I, I had an interest in technology, but I didn't think I really had an avenue to be able to express that because, you know, you know, I was going to college back in the late 90s, and um, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, like this field didn't exist, so it wasn't a thing that you could do. And honestly, I grew up in a little small town in Western North Carolina. I just did, I didn't know this was a thing that you could do. So I, I think I kind of evolved, and uh, I, I served as a, a local government planner. I worked in a local water resource utility company for a government. Um, I worked in a, as a county planner. Uh, and it wasn't until I, I guess I got into those roles that I, I started seeing that how much of what government does really needs to be, you know, what sort of skills you really need to be effective working in, in sort of government and nonprofit realm. And I saw a pretty big gap and disconnect between what's being taught in the academic programs versus what is actually needed in, uh, in public service. So that's kind of what motivated me is that I wanted to close that gap and to provide uh, a mechanism for helping to speed up this adoption of public interest technology and, and uh, modernize and, and engage in digital transformation um, because I see it getting larger and um, I think that's problematic. Hey, yeah, so uh, one thing I noticed that uh, didn't seem to be there that would be super helpful for some local governments, you know, not the one I work for, but the others, <laughs> would be something like COBOL, AS400 mid-range, DB2 instances, like the, the really old technology that is in many cases still running a lot of very important things. Oh yeah, I'd say that <laughs> well, my grad student uh, who I was doing the independent study is here, and we, we had a conversation on this just last week about how particular things, you know, mainframes and COBOL. You know, one of the readings we had was about the state of Montana that, you know, they were looking to digital transformation to the cloud, but so much of their infrastructure is based on these old mainframes that use COBOL, which is, you know, uh, so difficult to find people to do. And you think about procurement and, and modernization that um, their organizations, uh, I remember it was like U.S. Air Force Strategic Bombing Command that had like a 53-year-old uh, mainframe uh, database. Um, I was at a, in a major city a couple, I think about four or five years ago, a sheriff's dispatching, sheriff's dispatch department in a major US city and they were using a system from 1983 that had the green CRT screens where the letters had been burned into them. 
and all the keyboards had basically turned yellow from, you know, kind of like old Nintendos used to do after, after stuff like that. So yeah, so this digital transformation, stuff like that. But yeah, understanding um, legacy systems and the transformation to new digital capacities and, and uh, you know, not everybody can move everything over to the cloud immediately, that there's, there's uh, a tremendous need for people who understand those processes. Um. Hello. Uh, maybe related question. Can you give a sense of, so you mentioned uh, cross-training. Uh, how much depth and uh, how much breadth, how, how do you, how are decisions made about how much uh, one needs to learn in, in each of these different skill set areas? Um, I'd say that in the civic analytics program, we've taken this kind of tack that we want to enter, you know, we're, we're going to really drive home these, these kind of major constructs and these major operations. And then we weave into a lot of things where we know that not, not every context our students going to go into, that they're going to need uh, uh, every particular thing. But one thing I've really noticed, uh, it's something that I find in organizations like Shy Hack Night, but also in our students, is that they're willing to train up independently and um, often, you know, like, as long as they, they understand sort of the superstructure and the sort of infrastructures of, of large systems is that when they run into a, a problem, they tend to be able to find a solution. Uh, they've got a much more of a, they've got a very heavy research mindset in ways that I haven't seen in, 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 a, in, in a lot of students I've, I've taught in the programs that I've taught is that they're, they're willing to find often bespoke or coded situation, you know, things it's like, Oh yeah, well I, I need to do this or this or something like that, and I know where to look up and find a package or an application or other things like that. So I'd say as long as you have the major trunks of the tree, that that uh, we can cover some of the the branches and stuff like that. But uh, generally, giving you a framework to learn because we're not going to be able to teach you everything you'll need to know for your entire life, but we'll teach you how to essentially adapt to change and be able to. Um, implement these tools for the more specialized applications. I have a more general question about like just costs and master's degrees. Like how do you prepare students for these jobs that like, I've looked at these government jobs and they don't pay like nearly anywhere close to like private sector. And like, I, I have a degree from UIC back from 2006 when it was like $5,000 a year, you know? Like mm -hmm. how do you kind of balance or What's your take on preparing students for these public sector jobs that, from what I, from my limited knowledge, do not pay like, like they're like you know thirty percent less at least in salary wise. Yeah, I, I will say that um, uh, one of the advantages of our programs we're probably one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest, public sector data science program in the country. It, it, we were it was that at, at some one time, so there are advantages of still being at a at a public institution. So that's at least part of it. Um, I'll say that our, our grads have tended to go into places that have paid very well from a starting wage. Uh, I, I, I kind of made a joke when I founded this program. It's like it might be our only program where the students will graduate and start making more than the professors. And that's almost true. <laughs> uh, so I'd say that the compensation, particularly in public sector data, because there's so few graduates and because there's, there's such a need, and, and particularly here in Illinois, um, that that cost benefit analysis is a lot more favorable um, uh, than it, it might be, say, in, in other places or other states and things like that. But uh, I'll say there is public sector loan forgiveness, which I, I, I work. So there are, there, there are things out there for loan forgiveness that if you work in the public sector uh, for 10 years, you can have an income-based payment and uh, you can have loans discharged. So that's, that's another option, although I don't want to go too deep into that. I have my own question. Sure. Um, which is that I'm actually, I'm a consultant in essentially civic analytics. And I guess I'm curious what advice you have for consultants, like what is a constructive role for consultants to play in the ecosystem? And like, how can consultants help build the capacity of the public sector employees that we work with? Ah, that's kind of a, I'd say a little bit unusual because I'm not used to working with say civic analytics consultants where they're interested in capacity building for the, for the, uh, the people. Uh, um, I would say that, I, I guess a lot of the feedback that, because we have some advanced practitioners who, who teach for us and, uh, and we're mostly taught by full-time faculty, but we have um, very talented, very gifted uh, people who work in the industry and it's like that we have people who want to give back, but it's that, um, uh, I guess what's the, the way to put it is that, um, 
I also just forgot the question. <laughs> it was going there. Can you, can you ask that last part of the question? Just like what can consultants do to be, I guess, good citizens in the ecosystem? That's what it is. Uh, so I think part of it is listening and listening to what uh, a lot of times the people who are doing the contracting and the people engaged are not necessarily, you know, sometimes they're very engaged and very knowledgeable and see exactly where you fit in. And then sometimes you have people who are contract managers who don't understand and understand anything about the tech and they really kind of just, um, just, just tell me what I need type thing. Um, I would say that if the more that people can listen to the needs and, uh, you know, to learn, to do the little due diligence and think about, you know, uh, look into the, the, the policies and the processes that they're selling vendor solutions or consulting from beyond a surface level and really start to focus on what matters for that process. And, and uh, yeah, and I, I, I doubt this would be done much, but it's like when the solution doesn't work, uh, don't sell it. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, earlier about the uh, tech sector people that are coming into the uh, environment mm -hmm. and the learning curve that needs to happen with them and government types of uh, environments. Can you t talk about how you're trying to bridge that gap or maybe lower that learning curve? Yeah, I'd say that um, I guess my comments were with regards to hiring managers in the public sector in cities and metropolitan agencies and stuff like that. We're hiring people straight out of computer science programs or data analytics programs who didn't understand public problems. And I'd say the solution is a lot, you know, just creating programs like we have and technical training and doing research and just creating those resources is something that we want to do because um, it, it is a heavy lift. When you come from a computer science department where you've been taught how to do payment processing or program logic for uh, electric motors or other things like that, all of a sudden trying to measure the equitability of a social service program or um, uh, Think about the ethical ethical dynamics underlying. Okay, so what is what are the right cutoff points for some sort of government assistance program? It's just it's a very different mindset. It's a very different skill set, and it's one that frustrates a lot of people who try to move into this space. When I've talked to people who uh, are partners and are the people who advise the MSCA program, they said like I tried hiring this person. They stayed three months. They got fed up with all the bureaucratic stuff. They're very used to this. Uh, kind of very linear project orientation that's taught in computer science programs. It's like, we have this data, you know, we have this issue with the thing, we, we, we create a patch, problem solved, don't have to deal with it again. Public problems don't work like that. They're iterative, they're ongoing, they're, they're, some of them are not actually solvable, but we're looking to re reduce the severity and frequency of them. So, um, yeah, that if you're somebody who's got that technical training and you want to um, you want to do things in the public interest that you that you need to start to like look at the domain knowledge things but start to educate you know start to educate yourself on the uh, the problems the policy areas the methodologies that are used for that and it's 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 it takes a while to, to, to do but um, there are people who have done it successfully so I think that it's really a need to have um, to be open-minded that uh, social science, it feels so squishy to people who, like, I remember when I came from computer science and I got into social science, I'm like, oh, this feels so squishy. Nothing's ever right. People are reactive. Um, uh, so, but yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the secret sauce, I think. I got a question about, um, so say this uh, takes off and it's successful and like a lot of people do it and a lot of people go in your program and they come into the workforce with these skills. What do you think it could look like in five or 10 years? Like what kinds of impact do you think this kind of new way of, of approaching this problem um, could, could change things? Um, well, I, I'd say that there's, a, there's probably a lot of things to be gained in just sort of, um, I say one of the first things is just with digital transformation is to improve the dissemination of e-government services. You know, here in Chicago, we have quite a bit of things that we take for granted, you know, because we're in a major U.S. city and we have agencies and we have the economies of scale to create these programs. But more and more, it's pushing down these complex things into smaller contexts. 
Um, and, and often, you know, I mentioned low code, no code environments. You know, when you're starting to raise the, you know, not only provide people who are experts in providing these, these kind of technical analysis and, and leadership, but also, the, the, you know, as uh, the baby boomers have retired, as the Gen Xers get into senior management positions, you're going to have uh, Gen Ys and Gen Zs who are, uh, you know, particularly you know, Gen Zs are they're coming up into these roles that are digital natives that have, are very used to these sort of technologies. So I'm really interested in seeing, you know, what processes we can improve, what services we can make more efficient. Um, uh, I'd always learned in doing, in running some of our capstone programs uh, for the, the MPA program is that a lot of the causes of the problems we have aren't exactly what we think they are. Um, that uh, nonprofit medical clinic that I worked with, um, it pro its problem were more about its scheduling system and the transit connectivity of people to get to this free medical clinic. So as long as you can get to the clinic, um, that you have free medical care that, that's covered under um, either, sort of, either Medic, Medicaid or uh, private donors. But, um, but yeah, it, the, the issue was more in the processes and how things were scheduled and just the assumption that everybody had the transit. But only like 35 to 40 percent of the people showed up for their, their uh, appointments because of issues with the scheduling system and issues with uh, other things like that. Uh, uh, organ donation, <laughs> a great presentation in one of my ethics classes, that uh, 20 to 30% of organs donated in the United States are wasted uh, because of sort of issues in, in being able to apportion those out because of uh, uh, procedures and the data infrastructures that underlie it. So I would just say that it's kind of like what Tom did with um, the, 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 the food inspection stuff is that just making a lot of things better sometimes, maybe not in dramatic ways that that uh, immediately immediately catch people's attention. But you know, when um, you know when when people started to have to stop having to wait in line for two hours to get their drivers uh, you know, or getting their their car registration renewed, and we're able to do it online, that made people's lives better in ways that we don't always acknowledge. So it's that same sort of let's let's use data in ways that will improve people's lives and provide those new digital capacities that improve people's lives. But let's also rec recognize the limitations that we can't datafy or appify everything, that there are, going to people who, there are going to be people who are left behind and there is a need to understand uh, when a technology solution is not appropriate for interfacing with human systems. Um, I think that's a good place to end. So thank you again. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.